Damia, and hi everyone. I'm Jingqing Gao, greetings from New York. And I'm really happy to be here today and talking about you know, my study, my career experiences, and why we kind of like name it, this is like a round trip of my career and study, and also what brings me to you know, what I look like right now. And I will also introduce some interesting reason to research project uh, using emerging transportation technologies and also city as a living lab. And lastly, I prepare a small list of my tips and hopefully, you know, these tips will provide you some insight and confidence for your own research um, and future career paths. So let me start from, um, let me start from who I am. So first of all, I wanna claim that, you know, I am currently as introduced by Tasni and Lamia, a senior research associate at C2SMART, um, Transportation University of Transportation Center, which is a U.S. Department of Transportation designated Tier One University of Transportation Research Center uh, that task with leveraging you know recent advances in big data and technology to solve today's most pressing urban mobility challenges. However, dated back to ten years ago, I actually started as an undergrad student um, in physics department. <laughs> And my major called science and technology of optical information, but basically I was doing things like you know optical fibers, same films that that we use for like camera lens, and then I realized that you know after four years of study, or if you want to study physics and being a scientist, you probably need to learn a PhD degree, okay, <laughs> like or at least a master, because bachelor degree is somewhat not not sufficient, not enough uh, in that case. And of course, I was pretty young at that time, like you guys, and I was like, you know, uh, I don't want to do a PhD uh, at that time. So I decided to switch field, and this is how it brought me to transportation. Um, there's, of course, there's some family reason, personal reasons. My dad, uh, who I am very proud of him, but unfortunately, he is a professor in transportation. And also not in urban transportation, he's more kind of like towards maritime. Um, but secondly, I know some of you are here today are from School of Engineering and Physics Science. Uh, but I wanna be honest, uh, at that time, when I decided you know, if I want to do a master, I was like, I was just tired of uh, learning mathematics. <laughs> Plus I love subway system because I don't drive. And I was like, subway is probably, you know, one of the most innovative or smartest innovations in the world. It is a lifesaver for like people like me. So I applied to NYU and luckily I, I you know, was um, involved in this master program. I graduated from this two year master program in transport planning and engineering, thanks to all my professors. And then I got these two options. First, um, continue my study as a PhD student. And yes, I put back PhD as an option. And second, get some working experience. Um, and I think the greatest dis decision I made at that time is I talked to my professors. I actually talked to at least five of my, five or five different professors. Uh, some are full-time professors from the university. Some are like industry professors who has plenty of like industry experiences. And and of course, also considering my own desire and condition uh, in continuous study or working. Um, and what I learned from them and what actually pushed me to make the move to the next step is from the professor saying that, you know, transportation, like many other engineering majors, is a very practical subject, which means if you get some experiences from the industry, it will strengthen your understanding of what you've learned from the class. So I applied for jobs and I got an internship um, at the New York City Department of Transportation. And later after three months, uh, I became a traffic engineer for the modeling and data analysis unit, uh, where I kind of focus on big data analytics and traffic simulation modeling. And my next move, it's not that common, I would say, because I decided to come back uh, to academia, to NYU, and conduct my PhD there after working for two years at DOT. 
And my life at DOT was actually great. I was able to meet with different agencies, you know, US DOT, state DOT, talking with communities, working with different consulting firms. Um, and, and this is the time that I grow very fast in terms of, you know, professional skills and networking. However, this was also the time that, you know, all these new technology um, started to get attention, like, you know, AI, machine learning, connected aut autonomous vehicles. Um, and I came back to academia because academia is always at the cutting edge of these technologies. Um, and public agencies are also adopting them, but at a much slower pace, I would say. And I'm going to talk about these differences, you know, between public agencies and ad academia in a few slides. But this is how um, it kept me at academia uh, for my PhD and also after my graduation um, from my PhD. Um, I kind of decided to, you know, stay with the Situ Smart Center and became a, a, a researcher here under the center director, uh, Dr. Asbe's supervision in leading many of our national and local uh, research projects, such as we have like a connected vehicle pilot uh, in New York City, uh, which we equipped about 3,000 vehicles to use, you know, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, infrastructure protection safety applications. And this is what my next slide, emerging transportation engineering topic using city as lab is going to talk about. So there are a lot of emerging transport topics recently, including the ones that I just mentioned, you know, connected and automated vehicles. Uh, there's my micro mobility, like e-scooters, e-bikes, uh, both dockless or, or dock system, uh, electrical vehicles, or it can be even, you know, get to the next level, like connected electric um, automated vehicles, right? And mobility as a service, mobility on demand, and of course, are all the innovative mobility or safety solutions using um, artificial intelligence or machine learning, such as like computer, computer vision. And here, um, the key word is really this using city as a living lab. Um, and this is one of the key practical approaches our center is, is using in the past five years, and we found it very effective. Um, because, you know, ultimately transportation is such a major that it is happening every day in your daily life. You might wonder like, oh, why my train is not coming when you're waiting at the subway station, right? And this is how, you know, transportation operations, schedule management uh, come into play. And why you might ask yourself like, why someone just double park on the streets and block my way? And that is curb and parking management. Or uh, why I don't have a dock e-bike station near my house. And that is micro mobility, resource allocation and operational research. Um, so I personally think this is the most charming point of transportation and other engineering majors because what you learned, what you proposed might become reality one day on the road. Um, and I actually got my first paper published because I was annoyed by three double park cars in my neighborhood on one single road segment. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm going to look at the, the parking ticket data. I'm going to see why this is happening. You know, is there a way to mitigate it? And with that published paper, I was able to talk to more people, including like parking division of the local agency. And later on, I was able to bring this emerging transport topics into uh, this double parking problem. I added a computer vision component to, you know, help us to detect park cars. So this, this, this I, I think is a good example of how our research can be something that impact our daily life. Um, I'm giving you an example of NYC, New York City, but you should try to think about in the context of your own cities, you know. Are there any problems, issues you've been experiencing in your daily life, you've been noticed, you've been observed, um, and are there like public available data or maybe private owned data that can help you to analyze the problem to try to solve the problem. And um, additionally, you probably notice that, you know, a lot of these topics showing over here are multidisciplinary in nature. Um, and for connected and automated vehicles, for sure, you know, you need knowledge from not just transportation engineer, uh, but also from electrical engineering, from computer science, and maybe even like cybersecurity. 
um, and with efforts from you know, different department, university stakeholders, um, uh, one of the, the best practice that we have uh, at the City Mass Center over here is that we have created both virtual and physical test beds. Um, and, and sometimes they can be like, you know, both virtual and physical, which we call cyber physical test bed to help us uh, to utilize this concept of using city as living labs. And on the right side of the slide, um, showing some examples of the test bed. Some of these are uh, physical test bed, like you know the micro mobility one, um, the five G, uh, the, the you know and NSF Cosmos five G test beds in in uh, Harlem, New York. Uh, there are some cyber physical one like the flood net. Um, the, we build the flood sensor, so the sensor itself is physical, but then we also thinking of like turning the physical asset into digital twin technology, which kind of making it a digital set. Um, and we're giving information to the digital twin, we're giving data to the digital twin and getting like real time feedback information um, from the digital, digital twin back to the physical asset, which help us to monitor and you know predict conditions. We also have our CAV. Uh, test bed, and here we are adding some kind of uh, cyber physical components um, because for the next step, uh, we're gonna test like blockchain technologies uh, to minimize the cyber security vulnerabilities uh, for these type of like communications. Um, and we have like fully virtual test bed, which is this one called Medicine Agent Based Virtual Test Bed, which is a large scale open source agent based simulation test bed that we use. Uh, to test like new technologies at a large scale, like at, usually at the city level or regional level, uh, to see what is the impact of these potential policies. And uh, so from all these emerging technologies, I'm gonna just pick one topic today, which we did a lot of uh, efforts and progress on this project uh, using computer vision. We're creating these computer vision solutions for smart cities. And this project, this research project, uh, is focused on you know developing a deep learning based data acquisition and analytic tool using um, traffic cameras. And most of these are actually public available traffic cameras to try to under understand city with machine eyes. Uh, and the goal is really on the cost effective side because these public trans these public cameras like CCTV system, they are already there. So there's no additional cost like you don't have to uh, you know, purchase new cameras or use edge computing uh, to do computer vision at those new cameras. Um, we, you know, basically we we don't have to add additional costs to purchase new ones, uh, which keep the, the project really cost effective and, and within the budget for uh, local and state agencies. And the goal is really to uh, generate this new stream of mobility and safety data because there's a lot of rich information uh, that we can extract it from the images, right? You know, for example, the what is showing here, we can get the curb monitoring information, how many cars actually park on the street, on the curb lane. We can get lane occupancy, lane usage, uh, how many buses is utilizing our dedicated bus lane, dedicated bike lane, and we can also investigate if there's any illegal parking, um, if there's any walk zone events in, you know, like especially those temporary and short-term walk zones, which usually happens without, uh, you know, without letting people know. <laughs> um, and also like traffic incident detection, traffic accident detection. Um, and this project initially was actually from the idea uh, during COVID, because remember like during the COVID period, um, and even now, like people talk about social distancing a lot. So at that time, one of the research questions kind of came to our mind is that, you know, we know we are asking people to keep social distancing, but are they really complying to those, you know, social distancing policies, orders? Um, and, and what is the change, you know, in terms of time um, um, for that social distancing behavior? So we use this computer vision um, technology without going outside, without putting our people, you know, into the environment. We can like fully remotely monitor that from the cameras, from the detection output of the cameras uh, to see, to measure like, you know, uh, the distance between a pair of pedestrians and aggregate and quantify that information at, at the city level 
and and if we monitor that by time, we're able to tell you know how this behavior of pedestrian changes. Um, and the other two, which are either not uh, developed yet or a kind of in progress, uh, but I think these are also very interesting topic. One is connecting transportation to climate sustainability. Um, and you know, that we can do a flooding detection actually using computer vision. If you do like background extraction, we'll be able to tell there's, you know, this much of water um, that kind of covered the highways during like hurricanes. The other thing is corporate driving. You know, if we can do like pedestrian intention estimation, we'll be able to co connect that information with the vehicle information, with the infrastructure information, and to build this environment of, you know, cooperative perception. And, and through this project, there are a lot of collaborations uh, between academia, you know, our center, and also uh, public agencies, uh, which is here. One is New York City Department of Transportation, of course. Another one is New York City Department of Design and Construction, because they did a lot of like work zone our activities. And, and the, the approach that we use is that we first ask the agencies, what is your wish list? Okay, like what is the wish list of those computer vision solutions, applications? What is your, what are your desired features? And then our center offer uh, this fresh perspective and new problem solving strategies, you know, using the model that we built on, on, based on computer vision. And we collect periodic feedback from these public agencies uh, to know that if we're on the right track, if this is really what they want, are there any additional features you would like to add? You know, are, are there any like targeted accuracy level? Um, and, and in the end, this help us to develop like practical tools for the city uh, that they can share their video with us, they can share their right, real time traffic, you know, camera feed with us, and we will be helping them to do all the backend uh, detection and send the detection output to them. And, and this computer vision and solutions really centered, um, um, you know, first of all, leveraging existing public video data sources, as I mentioned. Second, of course, we use um, a lot of like object detection, object tracking algorithm like YOLO v5, strong sword, um, deep sword for different vehicle classes. And we also, uh, initially we start from some pre-trained images, you know, using Microsoft POCO data set, which is very well known data set for computer vision. But later on, we also try to customize and enhance our detection using the local images that captured from New York City. Um, we, we create a lot of post-processing filters uh, customized to different use cases uh, that we tested. And of course, if you're doing that for a period of time, uh, and also at large scale, uh, you'll be able to get like temporal and spatial uh, information from those detection. And here are some of uh, the images and videos that showcase the use cases that I've been talking about, you know, like detecting parking occupancy, monitoring bustling usage, identify illegal parking, double parking, uh, identify real-time urban walk zone detection. Um, and vehicle tracking, counting, social distancing. Uh, this one at the bottom has a mask on, on the people uh, so that this is a, a, a computer vision solution with a consideration of you know, privacy protection. And lastly, we also have our social distancing uh, algorithm here, which the blue line are actually the distance between a peer of pedestrians. Um, and, and there are a lot of trade-offs uh, while we're doing the project. Um, as I mentioned, you know, academia is developing state-of-art algorithms, uh, but sometimes we don't think about uh, like practical aspect of it, because usually, you know, some of the algorithms we develop may not may not be used right now. It might be very useful after ten years. Like even machine learning, uh, a lot of these techniques were actually developed, you know, ten years, twenty years ago, but it was just getting to practical uh, usage, you know, like in the reason maybe like five years. And on the other side, like agencies, public agencies, they're often, often looking for very practical solutions for immediate use in operation planning because they, their goal is to maintain our transport system, right? They want to increase the efficiency of the system. They want to manage the transportation uh, system more effectively. Uh, so the key here, 
I, I personally think is, you know, understanding the needs is very important because nobody's doing a wrong thing. Uh, and the reason why is just because the objective of academia and the objective of public agencies are kind of different. Uh, and also there's other of course, external factors to be considered of like budget constraints or resource constraints, like budget constraints at the public agencies, resource constraints, you know, at, at the new universities. Uh, but understanding is very important. Uh, that's why, you know, the, the approach that we use to get through audio feedback, I think is very useful because it helps us to understand, you know, we have a certain budget limit. Uh, this is what we want. This is what we can build from the university and how we can like bake in all these ideas together, but, but try to really look for a solution uh, for both ends, uh, you know, for the academic, uh, trying to get some practical data, video data from the agencies and test our algorithm for the, the agencies, uh, trying to get the support, technical support from the university uh, to achieve, to help them like better manage their systems. And this is a very quick um, example of the urban work zone detection application use cases. And the reason why I put it here is because this is uh, the most reason why. <laughs> The most recent research uh, use case for computer vision that my group, my team is actually working on. And we use two types of video data here, actually. One is the object detection uh, from you know, the live feed of traffic cameras. But, but here we also want to combine it with cloud sourcing information. Um, basically, all the video data collected from dash cameras, from like in vehicle cameras. Um, that is equipped on uh, either a prop vehicle or like a connected vehicle. Um, and, and, you know, some of the automatic, it's not like fully automated, but like partially automated vehicles. Um, and the challenges for work zone, for urban work zone, is that it's very different than the highway work zone because for the highway work zone, you have a standard like setup. You usually have the sign that's saying, oh, road work ahead, right? and usually see all the traffic cones that are placed on, on the highway roadway. However, for urban work zone, it can be in any, any type of format. Uh, from what we observe from you know, the, the images from the, the traffic cameras, sometimes we saw a simple steaming vent on the road, um, but it's, it is considered urban work zone. Uh, sometimes we see like combinations of you know, workers, cones, barrels, uh, barrels, you know, drums, um, channelizers, and um, sometimes it can be like man guardrail or or even just like the trench plate on the ground, which is blocking the way. Uh, so it can, can be in like very different format. And the other challenge is that even you have those work zone related objects, let's say you see a traffic cone on the road, it doesn't mean it is a work zone. But sometimes, especially in New York City, I'm not sure you know if it's true in your city or not, but in New York City, people sometimes just randomly put a traffic cone like behind their cars or they use a traffic cone to try to occupy a parking space, but it's not a work zone and it's not the actual work zone. So besides just detecting those work zone objects, we also have to classify, you know, if it is a true work zone or not. So for this specific use case over here, we also build a, a, a random forest classifier uh, that help us to, um, you know, based on historical train data, we collect information from 700 work zone and non work zone uh, with a different number of those work zone objects. And using that, we're able to do a classification, uh, a prediction model to help us to predict if this is an actual work zone or not. And of course, uh, this is not done yet, but to bring it to the next level of safety applications, we can try to track the vehicles, track the traffic conditions around the work zone. And then that will help us to identify like, you know, potential safety risk between workers and, and vehicles, pedestrians and vehicles, or even like vehicles uh, to the construction vehicle as well. And uh, this is also just a showcase of a video because I think it's, it's very visually appearing. Um, this is a pedestrian intention estimation, um, a prediction model that we apply to one of our videos. And basically, uh, the, the colorful lines you see here are the estimation of the 2D pose of a pedestrian. And, and for example, if we know the historical, uh, let's say, five seconds of what this, this pedestrian is behaving, uh, we will be able to test or predict you know, the next one second. And based on that prediction, we can tell if the people is crossing the street or if they want to jaywalk her, uh, become like jaywalking, 
uh, for the middle of the road or if they actually stay with you know the curb line and lastly my tips um so first of all from my personal experience that you see from the round trip the first tip I want to give is, you know, do not be afraid of fuel switch. And actually, one of the most impressive um, saying that I heard from my professor, because, uh, you know, the, for the first class I attended for transportation uh, in my master program, I was like, I was so worried because I know nothing about transportation at that time. So after class, I talked to the professors, I expressed my, you know, uh, kind of like express like I'm really afraid of that. And my professor says, one sentence, which I still remember it. Uh, he says, you know, because I am a non-transportation student at that time, I can actually think out of box compared with other uh, people who might be already in the transportation field for like five years, 10 years. And, and that is bringing to my next tips, you know, challenges sometimes can be opportunities. Like, a lot of time, uh, I know people are always talking about this like comfort zone. A lot of time you might be thinking of, uh, I want to stay with my comfort zone. You know, they, these are challenges. I don't want to touch it. But but think about even for these like emerging technology from transportation, they are difficult, right? Because they're new, like some of the technology or some of the use cases, maybe like nobody in the world was testing that. However, it, it also means these are all novel opportunities that if you're able to achieve it, you will be the first one in the field. So these are really great, you know, research opportunity. And, you know, we can use that use case to think about our life. You know, it can be like life opportunity for you as well. And one of the approach that I use most uh, every time I, I, I have to like step out of my comfort zone is that um, think about like you have, in most of the cases, you have nothing to lose. For example, I was afraid of giving public speech in the past. Uh, I was nervous, embarrassed when I talked to people, especially in front of like a large group of people. But then there's one day I was like, you know, you guys don't even know me, right? I have nothing to lose if I give a really bad talk. And after that, I was like, oh, this, keep, this kind of like give you a little bit of confidence and, and keep you, or uh, give you the encouragement to actually step out of the comfort zone. And, and after stepping that out, you see the graph over here, you may have this small fear zone, but after that, you will be um, open up your avenue into the, the learning zone, into the growth zone, and you will, you will grow very, very fast after that. So that's also very important. Um, and the next tip is networking and attending event are important. If you are here today, I think you're 80% success in this task. Uh, but just a tip to, you know, our, our, all the student chapters, the students over here, uh, we have a lot of resources, you know, like student chapter branches from this parent organization and all these parent organization, they're, they're terrific, they're brilliant. IEEE, ITE, ITS, you know, AICE, all these great parent organization, international, uh, national, um, being a student branch, student chapter of them, you actually have uh, the connection to a large network of professionals, right? Uh, and also they are always very, very nice to students because they know like students and kids are our future. Um, so, so don't be afraid, like using those connections, using those resources, attend those events, um, and, and not just the technical events, but also like, you know, networking, professional events, diversity inclusion events. And, and this is what I found, which really benefit a lot, especially some of the engineering major are, are kind of small, uh, you know, like transportation is a very narrow major, like after like attending maybe like five events, you're probably gonna know like 50% of the professions, uh, professionals in the field. So, so that's also very important tips. And this one, uh, if you're going to do a PhD, think about tough. So I'm not saying that you should not do a PhD, but I do think a very careful uh, consideration before you really get into your PhD is important. And, and, and the reason why over here is also uh, from one of my professors saying, because I was kind of hesitating, should I do a PhD, should I go to industry? And he said, it really depends on you know, your, your home country or your, your own condition. For example, in China, um, we value like PhD, like, like being a PhD is beneficial, not only as a professor, but even if you go to industry, it's also very beneficial. 
However, in the US over here, um, if you go into industry as a PhD, sometimes it can hurt you, unfortunately. But and and also the reason is very interesting because people people in the industry sometimes think a PhD might be overqualifying for them. Uh, so there's these complications. But but you know and, and and being a PhD means at least you have to study another five years. Uh, so consider that very carefully if you are thinking of being a PhD student. But if you decide to do so, stick with that because most of the time you find you know these learning life are actually very beneficial for your life. And the last um, tips I have is find good resources and stay curious. Um, so based on my experience and what I feel like you know what is missing during my PhD study. I actually created this um, CG Smart Student Learning Hub, which is an online learning hub. And we kind of invite student instructors. So, you know, on one end, the student instructors can learn um, teaching skills of teach what they've learned to other students, transfer their knowledge to other students. But the other time is, at the other hand is those students, uh, we're trying to promote this practical learning, apply learning and job, job preparation so that for example uh, we may spend like 10 minutes talking about what is computer vision and then 30 minutes of how to build a toy model in computer vision so all these kind of learning resources are very very uh, important and my last slides is a little bit more saying to transportation but i think you can think about the other resources in your engineering major and in your country because uh, there are a lot of open data portal resources available uh, for example, in US, we have this National Transportation Libraries, which basically you can find all the reports from state DOTs, you know, national uh, studies or studies conducted by university transferring centers. There's this ITS deployment evaluation database, which uh, summarize, you know, the benefit, costs, and lessons learned from an actual deployment of ITS, you know, intelligence transmission and systems. And I'm pretty sure there's very similar resources in your country, in your region that you might not be aware of at that time, but like time by time, you know, trying to gather those information because they, they are very helpful. They make, they will make you knowledgeable of where I can get this data, where I can test my ideas and ultimately transfer that knowledge um, and, and push you, you know, kind of like to stay curious about science and turn that into a research. And, and again, ultimately to turn that into a practical solution for your city uh, in the end. And I think that is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jinghin. That was a fantastic, um, uh, you know, uh, talk. And then I, we already have a couple of questions and we will go to that. But before that, would you mind giving me back the hosting um, option? Sure, sir. Yeah. You go. Thank you so much. All right. Um, let's go to the question and answers. Um, I think the first question is by Ayon Deb. And he's asking, how can densely populated countries like Bangladesh and India benefit from this connected and autonomous vehicle system? Roads here are always packed with traffic, has multiple potholes, pedestrians crossing roads randomly. So now if the cameras detect such objects, won't the system be giving out multiple alerts simultaneously? Sure. Um, so first of all, you know, one of the biggest benefits, of course, for connected automated vehicle, uh, a lot of them are still pilot, right? We don't really have like super, super large scale uh, deployment of this system. But however, even from this limited pilot, what we find the most benefits probably is both for mobility and safety. And think about, uh, let me give, an ex give you an example. Think about the parking system. For example, in US, there are statistics that says that 30% of the road congestion are actually coming from people looking for parking spot. And think about if all the vehicles will be connected and not just saying like vehicle talk to vehicle, but also like vehicle talk to let's say parking infrastructures um, or getting like more real time information. And if it's, if we bring it to like automated vehicle, of course they can, you know, automate it, like uh, search for the roads by themselves. And think about if those applications are at large scale, 
which means you can eliminate at least 30% of those time that wasted in finding a parking spot. Because now you know exactly where there's an open spot for parking and how many minutes it's going to take me to go there. What is the shortest route, right? And to find, to, to reach to that parking spot. So I think that's something that definitely going to um, benefit from CAV. However, uh, I want to bring it up. One term that we use a lot in CAV is called market participation rate, you know, NPR. And the percentage of adoption of these system is very important. And we, I used to have a discussion or say a debate with the student that um, until it reaches to 100%, sometimes, you know, in a mixed traffic condition or in a fully automated traffic condition, it can be very different. A lot of ideal benefits might be achieved only we kind of reaching a certain uh, threshold of that NPR rate. And, and depend on the use cases, some of these minimum threshold can be high threshold, but, but some applications, we can achieve benefit even within like just 10%, 20% of the CAVs. And I think like prioritize those use cases probably will help like city like Bangladesh or India uh, uh, to benefit. And, and, and also you need to, you need to trade off, you know, uh, between the safety benefit and mobility benefit because a lot of times they cannot be achieved at the same time. Uh, if you want to prioritize mobility, then maybe select the application that is proved to provide, uh, I would say, you know, the maximum mobility and, and in terms or, or, or kind of like a, a balance between mobility and safety. And I think there's a side question right now if the camera detects such object, won't the system be giving out multiple alert? Oh, that's a very great question because we have the same question when I conduct this, you know, uh, connected vehicle pilot in New York City. Well, like how the system works, you know? If I'm getting a large bomb forward collision warning, am I and, and I'm like speeding on a curve? Am I also getting alert from our you know curve speeding and alert at the same time? So apparently, of course, they cannot be giving at the same time because audio you can only play one sound of audio at the time. There are some priority level that uh, the vendors design, and um, and. I don't know 100% of that, but I think they kind of having an evaluation of, you know, which alert might be more urgent. For example, forward collision warning might have slightly lower priority compared with an emergency brake warning. Because if you're under a condition where that triggers emergency warning, that probably means you're, you're in a very, very dangerous situation already. Um, so, so there's there's this certain like evaluation uh, of like different level of priority, but this is an ongoing topic, and uh, it can be very complex. Uh, you know, it can be even getting to like game theory of uh, as a driver. You know, if you're gonna make the decision of uh, make yourself injured or or make the pedestrian injured. Um, so there's there's this ongoing debate and uh, research on how we uh you know set up the priority of the of the alert how we make it um and and also make it not annoying because sometimes you may get too many alerts from the system and that's actually one of the uh, driver feedback from the driver survey of the cv pilot that uh, for certain type of alert they do think they receiving too much and that then they become less effective because people stop listening to it because of that True, true. Thank you. That's a very insightful answer to these questions. I hope um, the students are getting their answers very good. We have a few more questions left, Jingxin. Um, so I have Nanjiva asking, um, how, how would the AI um, help the environment, uh, the major consideration in transportation engineering? So there's a lot of aspects, uh, and the one that I just mentioned, the flood net, is definitely a perfect um, example. Because um, we start from, you know, using uh, electrical engineering and, and computer science technology to build those flood flood net sensors, and ultimately they also turn that into digital twin, um, which can help us to predict, you know, flood level uh, much earlier. And, and also at the network level. Uh, and, and one of the recent advances that we're doing is, you know, we, we kind of like, we should consider about community. 
So uh, a recent goal is using those flood sensors to, based on AI technology to help with like low income community to help improving the access of these community during emergencies, uh, during hurricane times. Um, plus also improve the access of emergent vehicles uh, because you know sometimes like, the, lo the road is flooded, emergent vehicles is not aware of that and they may spend you know much more time to get into the same uh, because of that. So all these like AI technology and it can be combined. You know, it's not a, like standalone system. We have the flood detection system. We also can use this you know traffic camera to detect flooded highway uh, using computer vision, right? If we combine these uh, system with maybe like the traditional uh, dispatch system of emergency vehicles, if we combine with a uh, traffic management center, which is like centralized center uh, that uh, monitor the the entire situation of the city. Um, and we can create some AI based algorithm, machine learning based algorithm to do um, incident duration predictions, uh, you know, flooding, um, not say duration, but like severity of flooding predictions. Um, and, and also, like, in as an integrated different source of data, it's not only the traffic data, everything is related. So, you also need to get the data from the weather stations for the prediction of the weather. Um, and if all of these can be built into one application, an integrated one, it can be a very comprehensive approach, which can be used to enhance, uh, you know, environment sustainability of the city. Nice, right? Yeah, um, uh, flooding is actually a pretty big deal in um, our country too. So I'm glad you brought that up. You know, it was in your slides too. So definitely a major research uh, topic to focus upon. Um, we have more questions coming. Great. So Samiha is asking, as a female mentor in Sage Smart Lab, how would you encourage other fresh graduate females to start their career in transportation engineering? Let me just add there, Samiha is um, in a leadership position at IEEE Women in Engineering. So this is, I can see why she would ask this question. This is very you know, appropriate. Yes. This is actually a very important question and the question that I was expecting because uh, I, I, like I don't have time to touch a lot on the female engineering part, uh, but just to give you an example, like over here uh, at NYU, we also, and I think our current uh, ITE student president, Nick, is also online right now. Uh, we actually have a series, uh, a diversity inclusion talk series called Women in Transportation Panel Discussion. So like every year we invited um, like four women leaders from industry, from academia, from public agencies to come and give a panel discussion talk uh, to the the student, but also you know like um, candidate student who who is interested in NYU, um, or like student who's within ITE, but they might be from other other schools or, or K twelve programs. Um, and and I think that's a very great approach of talking about you know. Uh, our experience as a female engineer, like what we've been, what we've been learned, um, not just the bad side, but also the good side, right? Um, and also, um, it is it is very beneficial to kind of knowing the information that, like even for me, like I was not aware of some of the statistics or some of the situations that this female leader talk about. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that is tied to my tips of you know challenge sometimes is also opportunity because what i learned from my study is that when i enter my master program i was actually the only female student in the group but some people may think about this is a challenge because you kind of like work or study in a, in a, a male dominated environment and um, however uh, if you think of, think from think of this from another aspect this is also a challenge because you're the only female student so there's a lot of I would say like resources um, and, and sometimes there's, uh, I mean, this might be a little bit too honest, but <laughs> sometimes there's a certain like diversity resources, inclusion resources are dedicated to female students or uh, let's say like minority groups uh, or on the uh, like historically underrepresented groups. And these, I would say like use it. Because these are the resources that are de dedicated for us and it will help you like not only uh, in your research study, but also in your life. And, and that's kind of the component I say, um, this is challenge, but if you think about it from the opportunity side, you will be more encouraged and benefit. And, and I would say um, also because like, 
I, I don't want to make a prototype, but but also because like female male, sometimes we think about the same question from different ways. But this is kind of like tied to that think out of box as well. And you have your own strengths, um, your personality, your knowledge, you know, as a female engineer, female student, and that can contribute as a whole uh, into the team. And teamwork is very important, you know. Uh, male, male co co-workers, uh, partner, team members, and if everyone is working together, uh, you know, you, you will make them more understandable of, of your challenges, but also you, you, you can learn from them, they can learn from you, and it will become a great teamwork, um, at least based on my experience. Yes, uh, thank you. So, wow, we, we had a lot of questions and we are almost um, at the end of our event, but um, so we'll just take one more question. I think there's one, um, there are two left, but let's go for the first one that came. So you already gave quite a few um, insights about how to get involved, but I, I think um, our students would like to know a little bit more about that line. That means they are interested, they have been motivated by your talk. So Nanjiva is asking, what are some easy ways to get involved in the transportation engineering research path? Oh, I would say like, you know, take all the opportunities. Uh, for example, that internship I got at DOT and New York City DOT, I actually started from unpaid internship. Um, I mean, of course, uh, money is an issue, right? <laughs> but uh, think about if your goal is to get experience, then don't, don't be afraid or speak out, or speak up to the professors. And you know, talk talk with the professor that teach your classes. And talk with the professors that you might not even know, but you're interested in their research. Do your little research on the website about what project they're doing. If you're interested in that particular project, if you're interested in you know what the center is doing. A lot of times, taking our center as examples, I got emails from my supervisor, from Dr. Otto, who is the center director, saying that oh, this student volunteered to uh, you know to be in our lab during the summer. He's interested in this computer vision project. Can you talk to him? Can you chat with him, with her, to see if he kind of like fits into our plan? And I would say like 80% of the time we accept those students because, you know, student who has curiosities and uh, I would say initiative or doing research are always the student that we as a research center are looking for. So, so evaluate what is your goal. Uh, you know, make clear what is the objective that you want to achieve through this research and uh, speak to professors, speak to professionals that you meet at those networking events, you know, at those like IT events, IEEE events. Uh, just, just open up, say that I'm really interested in research and don't be afraid of sending out a few emails. As I said, you know, you won't lose anything. It won't harm you if they don't respond to you. That's the worst case, right? And it, it is fine. So that, that's, I think, one of the uh, not say shortcut, but one of the effective ways to get involved into research. And once you step out the first step, you will be naturally, you know, like built it into a lot of new opportunities in research, uh, in research paths. You will be open up to like new ideas, new research ideas uh, in different directions after that. Exactly. Thank you. That has been fantastic. And I'm glad we got to do this. Um, Jingqin, thank you for your time. I know you're super busy. Thank you for explaining and discussing your research to all these uh, very interested audience here. We had a very, very good um, you know, attendance. And I would like to thank um, the large number of people who were involved in uh, making this great collaboration between NYU and NSU you know, come to life today. So, um, uh, the audience you've already met Tasni at the beginning so she is part of North South University IEEE student branch um, group and she's currently also the secretary of IEEE um, industrial application society student branch chapter there and um, we had women in engineering affinity group as I've said before involved in it we also had um, so school of engineering and physical sciences and um, uh, not only that, from the NYU side, we had C2 Smart entirely helping us out for the whole thing. We have our uh, C2 Smart speaker. We um, Molly is here, who has helped very much with um, everything in the event. And Nick on the other side, he, uh, he is the student branch um, leader of ITE here at NYU. So thank you also, Nick, for all your help. So this was a very nice international collaboration. 
uh, together. And hopefully we can do more of this in the future. Okay. And um, Jinchin, do you have any last words um, for our audience? Oh, I would gathered? just say thanks for inviting me to be here. And you know, as a past president of IT student chapter over here, I think you know student chapter collaboration between student chapter, and maybe that can be a future thing, even like international collaboration. You know, between the the IT uh, IEEE student branches at uh, your university and at NYU over here. It could be very beneficial because we have different cultural background. We may have different transportation, you know, issues, or sometimes I would say different, but also similar transportation issues, engineering issues, science issues, problem challenges that we've been facing, um, and or even just in terms of like organization excellence. You know, there's a lot of lessons learned maybe from our side, from your side. So it would be a really great opportunity. Uh, I would suggest for future collaboration if the student chapters can talk with each other. I think that will be, you know, terrific, fantastic uh, future. Definitely. So I'm uh, looking forward to that collaboration. And with that, um, let's enter today. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.